Um, thanks for joining us today for the CTD webinar, Creative Technology for Inclusion and Engagement. Most of us know about many of the most common technologies that are available to help students with disabilities, um, but in today's webinar, John O'Sullivan, librarian and AT specialist, is joining us to explore creative technology to help struggling learners better access the curriculum um, and engage in art and music activities. I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to John. Yeah, it's great to be here. Um, really looking forward to this. The title of this is Creative Technology for Inclusion and Engagement. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I see we have 24 people here. That is absolutely wonderful. I hope more people join us. Um, that's great. So welcome. And uh, this is, that's, that's my background. Like she said before, I'm a technology, a technology integration specialist. I became a librarian. I do assist technology. I have a background in special ed. Uh, I've also written a number of books on educational technology. And the whole point of this presentation is to try to get people technology that they haven't thought of using before and hopefully fulfill some needs that you didn't think that you had um, to try to get beyond a lot of the common technology that people think of immediately to use. So we're trying to look beyond then be a little bit more creative and try to find technology that you haven't heard of before, trying to think outside the box a little bit. So um, that's what this uh, webinar is all about. So poll question, have you ever tried to make modifications to include special needs students in art class? See, we're having a, a varied response. It, it, it's, uh, we have in the 70s for yes, but we have some, some people who haven't. Okay, give people a little bit more time to vote. Um, give people another 15 or 20 seconds. Okay, I don't see the numbers moving, so, so we have about 17 people voting, so I'll assume we're close to being done. But I see that most people have, which is really good because actually I didn't I didn't know the answer to that. I didn't know what most people would say. Um, uh, I have made um, modifications in order to include a student in our class. I've done it before. I've also made changes where I help someone with a disability do art, which would be in a regular classroom, which wasn't necessarily specifically for our class. But in the younger ages, when they do uh, projects and things like that, a lot of times there's artwork involved just to help include them. So um, that is wonderful that a lot of people are doing that. Um, so that's something that we're going to be talking about. So those were the poll results. Okay, so um, I just want to point out that uh, the six videos we have here, and I also have six extra videos. If you, if you save the, the uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, that we're using, if you download it, there's six other videos that you can look if there's something you're interested in. I made a couple extra videos. And obviously this webinar is being recorded, so you could go uh, to the YouTube channel for the Center on Technology and Disability and to, to, to watch the entire presentation if you'd like. I just want to remind people of that. So why do we want to include people in our class? There's a number of reasons. Um, obviously because it's an issue um, for some people. And if you've ever sp spoken to someone who hasn't been included for whatever reason it was, whether it a disability or there was some other issue, people remember that. Um, it sticks with them years later. Um, you think that at some point people will say, okay, that happened a long time ago. But people remember being excluded. Uh, so whenever we can, we want to include people and have people with disabilities having a similar experience to everybody else in class whenever possible. I mean, we can't do everything we want, but when we can include someone in a class, we make them feel valued. Obviously, they get that great learning opportunity that everybody else does. And, and that's very important. I, I think that contributes very much to a positive atmosphere uh, in a school system. So whenever we can include people, um, I, I, always, I always try to push for that. And, and when I can include someone in a subject in something that's difficult and challenging and we can get them to include them with everybody else, to me that's a big one. That's something I really enjoy as a teacher when someone can be included and we can overcome that challenge. So. The first program we're talking about, a lot of people might have heard of this before. A lot of people do use this one, but we're leading into art class. It's called SnapType Pro. And what this program is used is people with coordination issues, usually fine motor coordination with writing. And what they do is they take a picture of a worksheet 
and then they they type on it. You could you know type on it with your fingers, just like you can see in the graphic there. And also with an iPad, they have something called dictation, where you can click on a little microphone icon if you have an uh, iPad 3 or later, and you could talk to it and it'll type what you're saying. So you have two options. So a lot of people use this app called SnapType Pro for people who have handwriting difficulties. But what people haven't thought of doing is using this with the, for art. Okay, so I'm going to go to the next slide. This is a video of me using SnapType Pro. So it's kind of hard to talk about and describe using the program without people seeing it. So I think the visual is very important. So in this video, you're going to see me using it. And then we're going to show you how uh, I'll hit play. And then I'll show you how we're going to use this with an art program. And I'm going to hit play. I'm going to show you right now how to use SnapType Pro. This is an iPad app that helps people with difficulty with handwriting. It looks like a camera and says the word pro in the corner. We're going to click on it. I'm going to click on new document, camera. I'm going to take a picture of this worksheet with an elephant on it. I'm going to hit the little button, the orange button. I'm going to hit the little crop symbol behind, under the elephant. I'm going to crop it. The check mark box in the corner. I have to name it. Click add. I'm going to open it. I'm going to click on it. I can type hello on it and hit enter. What I can also do is I can click on the microphone in the bottom corner and I can talk and I'll type on it. This is called dictation for the iPad, so I'm going to click on that microphone. I am making a video. See, it works really well. But what most people don't know about this is you can actually save it and import it into another app. So the uh, symbol on the top right corner, it looks like a box with an arrow on it. That is internationally known for transferring files. I'm going to click on it. I'm going to click on image. Click on save image. All right, now I'm going to go to pictures. Here are my photos. And there's my elephant. Okay. I'm going to go into Art Studio, which is right up here. I'm going to go to File, Import from Photos. I'm going to click on my elephant. And now I can go to the Art Tools and I can paint on the elephant. And then I can click on the finger and I can smear the elephant. What this is designed to do is so that if you had someone who say had a physical disability or tactile issues, they could use this instead of using traditional paints or clay or or whatever you're doing. Um, it also opens opens up more options to just even to write on it. Like I could make this black and I could uh, you know, write on it. I could write it on with different brushes. I could write it on with a pencil. I could sign my name on it. So it gives me options of things to do if you have a tactile issue or if you have a physical disability or limitations. And this, we, I figured this out when we were working with a, with a preschooler, but you could use for different ages. Obviously, you could type on a worksheet, but you can also do artwork. And it's a good way to include someone with various types of disabilities, even if it's a, a matter of being able to follow multi-step directions where you could get this on the iPad and set up for them and they don't have to do 10 different steps or if they have physical limitations of using a paintbrush, they only need a finger for this. Now, I just want to show you one more thing. In settings, under general, under keyboard, you can see keyboards right there. Dictation, enable dictation. That's how you get the microphone on your keyboard you click enable dictation so if you have an ipad 2 or lower it won't work if you have an ipad 3 or higher dictation does work on all ipads Okay, so Art Studio is, is one of my um, favorite apps when it comes to art uh, because it's simple and it has a lot where it, it does um, things that are 
you can do very simple things with it, with just drawing and painting. And it has higher level features that are similar to Photoshop, like it has things like filters. So you could use it with someone who's younger, or you could use it with someone who's older. You could use it with a wide range of students. And that's why I really like uh, this particular app. And when you use two apps together, the big buzz term is called app smashing. So you're using one app to app smash with another one. It just means you're using uh, one file and you're using it in two different apps is, is what app smashing means. Now, so I, I really like this program. This one's for the iPad. Now, I've, coming up, we're gonna, I list ones that are for on other platforms. So don't worry if you um, uh, don't, ha don't use iPads. But I, I'm going to show a quick video about how to use Art Studio so you can get a better idea because there's only so much I can talk about it uh, where, where you can't. I can talk about it, but there's only so much you can show you by just so talking about it. So we have that video coming up of Art Studio, and you can see exactly how it works, detail for detail. This is my favorite art app. It's called Art Studio. And with this app, you can create all sorts of, of awesome artwork. And you get the feeling of hands-on actually physically touching the art, manipulating it. And at the same time, you get the benefits of Photoshop. All these different tools up here, like you see like Adjust. They have up there, Adjust, Select, Layers. That's a, a Photoshop concept. Image, Resize, Filters. Filters will actually change the image. You could, it could make it uh, change the colors, the shape. Like the top one's blur. Sharpen means makes it more clear. Uh, distort noise makes it look like... Um, like it gives like almost like a spray spray pattern on it, a whole bunch of different things on this that you could you could do really cool effects if you're doing high end art. But at the same time, you don't have to be an artist to do this. You don't have to know Photoshop and all that. The tools on the left hand side of the toolbar, like the paintbrush, I could simply just pick a color and pick the paintbrush and just paint with it. And I could there's a another brush beneath that. I'll put that in a different color and I could paint with it and then I click on the finger and then I can smear it and I, I could really you know get into the nitty-gritty of actually creating the art the paint bucket beneath it if I did that it would, it would just dump all one color on it the gradients kinda cool if I do that it makes like a whole gradient of color and then they have a text tool which I could type things on it there is spray paint I'll pick a, a different color so you can see it and I could spray paint on it a color and obviously, having some art talent would help, but you can also import images. One of the cool things with Art Studio is you can import, so I can take a picture, and then I could change that picture with the filters, or I could paint on it. So I could import that. Or you could actually export the photos and save it as like a JPEG as a picture. But what I find with this, with this app is that when you give it to students, within five minutes they figure it out. They, they can go and pick different colors. And they can certainly click on the different the different um, tools that we have and integrate them in any way they want and then take their finger and smudge it if you want to erase part of it you could so e even if you're not an artist there's a lot you can do this so this program could work with students who are a little bit younger it's possible and obviously if somebody really really um, likes the higher end of it they could certainly go into thing under learn photoshop concepts like layers or or filters or could go in and adjust the colors in any number of ways uh, but it's really great because you get the hands-on feeling of doing the art and someone who doesn't have the coordination this is really really great because uh, with just one finger you can do art where you don't necessarily have to hold the brush and you you don't you don't have to hold the art tools and, and be precise with them this is john l sullivan Okay, now the other aspect I want to mention is when you use, do art on a tablet, you get that hands-on feeling of art with, without actually touching paint or clay or something like that. But it's that hands-on feeling where if you're working on a PC with the mouse, it's not the same, but you can really feel like you're creating when you're using a tablet. That's why I, I tend to like creating art on a tablet. For, for, for Even for regular ed students, it's really great because we've, we've done it with both. We've done it with special needs. We've done it with uh, regular ed. And that that hands-on feeling of creating the the art doesn't go away, uh, which is huge. And of course, you don't run out of paint, and then you don't run into tactile issues because you're touching glass 
you're not touching anything that's kind of wet or damp or or might feel uncomfortable, um, which is which is really good. And you need less coordination to do it, uh, which is also helpful if someone has fine or gross motor, motor problems. So one of the things I wanted to point out with this is that something called AirPrint. AirPrint is the iPad when they print stuff, or or Apple when you print stuff. AirPrint. These are network printers that work with an iPad because one of the things that we did was when we were using programs like um, Art Studio and SnapType Pro, we wanted for like a preschooler or someone who's in kindergarten for that, them to be able to print out their artwork and hang it up in the refrigerator just like everybody else. I know everybody's going to file sharing and I'm all for file sharing. I think file sharing is wonderful. That is great. But if you want to be able to print it, that's that's what you have to look up is air printing uh, if you wanted to print out the artwork. And I always try to remind people, like if you're using an iPad, if you can get an Apple TV and project it, it, it adds a whole new dimension to your classroom. Um, I just I just want to mention that. I wish I had more time to go into uh, projecting with an iPad, but you can you can show students how to do things, the whole class and the board how to use it. If you have a an, an Apple TV, it's um, it's really something that makes the classroom more dynamic. So I listed. I listed some some art apps because I know not everybody has an iPad. I know I, I wrote an app guide years ago, and I've tried to move beyond this, so I'm not all about the iPad anymore. So these are iPad apps for kids, which which are good for the younger grades. Um, if you download the PowerPoint, you can get this list. I also included a video I did on 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 Luxstraw, um, which is similar to um, uh, Art Studio, except it's for kids. It doesn't have as many of the uh, higher level things that Art Studio has on. It's, if you want a simpler program, Luxor might be one option. But I listed a bunch of others um, that you could use for the iPad for kids. And this, this would cover for, for younger ages. And if you were looking for stuff for an Android device, I listed some examples as well. And I listed more examples for the iPad for, for adults for art. There is actually a lot out there. If you want to do art, they have everything. They have painting, if you want to do charcoal, drawing. There's so many uh, different apps with different spins, and it's a matter of taking the time and using them. And most of them aren't that complicated, and what I find is that when you give them to students, they learn them so quickly uh, because you're just touching it with your hand and manipulating. A lot of it, it's, it's more intuitive than it is for other types of apps. So uh, if you are on a Chromebook, which a lot of people move to Chromebooks, Google Draw I recommend. You don't get the same hands-on feeling because you can't smear things, but I also included in the PowerPoint a video about how to use Google Drawings. If you're you're interested in using that, um, that's an option. Uh, if you're using Chromebooks or if you're uh, heavily a Google school, so I'm going to move along. So I and they listed also two other uh, free websites as well on top of uh, Google Drawings. Okay, so we went through a lot there. So. Um, like I said, if you're looking for any of those programs listed, I recommend downloading the PowerPoint and um, maybe trying one of those if you're on a different platform than iPads. Even though I very much for people with disabilities am very strongly in favor of iPads, I still think for people with disabilities that tends to be uh, one of the, the dominant platforms to, to use with them. But I know a lot of the schools are going towards a Chromebook, so uh, I want to make sure people had options. So what I want to talk about now is why do we want to include people in music class? Um, and it's a lot of the same. It's just a lot of the same things as well. And I know when I was younger, people did well in school. It's like they got to play a musical instrument. If you're in struggling in school, you did more reading instruction. And I know a lot of people remember that. Even if if you weren't in special ed, a lot of people remember that somebody else was getting to play a musical instrument as a reward, and um, and and you weren't um, having the opportunity to play that. So it's very important. People tend to feel valued if you're including them into every single class and, and, and taking as, as much effort as possible to include them. So um, music is also an area where I like to see people with disabilities included as often as possible. So we have a poll question. Have you ever tried to make changes to include special needs students in a music class? I'll give everybody uh, a minute to try to answer that. So we have about 60% no, and about let's let's looks like it's getting a little closer. Okay. A 
Okay, we, we're getting a lot of people. We get about 17 answering. We'll give a little bit more time and see if we get a couple more people who, who can respond if they want to. We're about 19 responses. Okay, so it seems about split. Most people, slight majority, haven't done this. And for some reason, I know art class seems to come up because the younger ages they tend to do a lot with art. So we tend to get that. There's actually a lot of technology out there for music. There's more technology for music than there is for art, which is surprising. But I think the instance of including people in art tends to come up more often because the younger grades, uh, preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school, they tend to do uh, enough projects with art that that question comes up in the regular classroom a lot of times. But there's a lot out there for music. So if we want to include people in music, obviously that's an opportunity that we want to allow every student possible that we can. So move along to the next one. The, um, the, uh, the program, this is a, a website I found recently. It's called Chrome Music Lab. It's, a, it's very simple ways you can, you can play on a website, these very almost uh, uh, musical instruments on a website. It's very simple. It works great for kids. It's actually a lot of fun. It's, it's something you, if you, um, you know, you know, were stressed out, you could go and do for a little while and you feel better about yourself because it's so simple and so intuitive to do this. But there's a lot out there for music for the younger grades and there's a lot out there for music for the, for the older grades. So you can find like an instrument that's very simple and if you wanted somebody who wanted to mix a bunch of different music and, and to make something that was very, very well thought out and planned, you, you could do it um, when it comes to uh, creating music with computers. It, we've come a, a long way in the past five, ten years. So I'm going to go to the next slide. This is a video of me using the website and explaining it. And there's actually a lot more on the website than I get to show you. I wish I could show you it all, but obviously we have time limits. But it's really, really simple. It's really cool. And you could teach younger children very basic things about you know, rhythm or music or sounds with this. So um, we can uh, load up the video in a minute, and I'll play it. And um, okay, it's loading up, and we'll hit play. This is a website I really like. It's called Chrome Music Lab because it can be used to teach basic music concepts to younger children. So here's the first one, Song Maker. So basically what you do is you click on these. And you hit play. And obviously you could do this with the rhythm, and you could do this with the scheme, and you could create a basic song in this and understand how the different sounds can be mixed. Um, and anyone with any sort of background could experiment with this and create something with music. This one is rhythm. So basically you put in sounds and the, the, they play the drums for you. cute, it's simple, and you could teach basic rhythm with this and, and different components of a song, and you wouldn't really have to have a dynamic music background in order to, to use this with a classroom. Now this one teaches chords. Those are the major chords, and you can switch to the minor chords. So even if you weren't a musician, you could show different chords of music. Very simple, something that you could you could use for a few minutes. This is John O'Sullivan, Chrome Music Lab. I hope you liked it. Yeah, that that that's a great website. Now, if if you're in any device, you could use it. Since it's a website, obviously you could use it in a Chromebook, you could use it on an iPad, you could use it on a PC, and, and it's so simple. And you know, there's a lot out there for music. I, I know that there's a ton of synthesizer apps for the iPad, but it's crossed over. It's There's stuff on the Android. There's also a lot of stuff for Chrome, which surprised me because, um, you know, when you see stuff out there and you don't see people in large groups using it, you wonder, is this stuff going to stay around? Is it going to be around? And there's a lot out there for music. 
that's that's on different platforms that you can use if you want to teach music to students with disabilities or to use the whole class or to use as, as a different type of activity as a reward. There's just so much out there. So this is GarageBand. This is for the iPad. It's also, they have a Mac version. And this one is great because you can play a number of different instruments. And then if you wanted to, you could then mix all the sounds from those instruments together. So you can do something with this. It's free. It comes with the iPad. And you, you, can, you can do something extremely simple with it, or you can get very complicated very quickly. Like it's literally designed to play a bunch of, of different instruments. There's all these different instruments. And if you want to mix them together, you can. So it's anything from someone who's just playing around and is a complete novice who, who wants to do something very simple with music to somebody who really is trying to compose something that they want to show to other people or put in line or use as background music on something. So it, the, the spectrum of, of users for this is there from beginner to way more advanced. And it's for the iPad and it's free. It's been around for a long time and it's all, both on the iPad, I know it's on the Mac. But it's a really, really great program because of the versatility to it. Where I know a lot of the other programs that I've looked at it are really great, but they're, they're designed for, for a specific audience. So I would tell you if you have an iPad, it's free. You can just download this. I'd recommend trying uh, GarageBand. So this is an app that I really like. This is one for the iPad. It's a drum app. And what it actually does is you put it on the table and you tap on the table and it turns like into like a sound of a drum. You, they have different drums, like they have one's a metallic drum, one's like a bongo drum. You, you, it, you can play the drum by putting the iPad on your table and tapping it. I actually use it in the library uh, in my makerspace. And, you know, if students are stressed out having a tough day, this is a great way to get them involved. And, and we've even tried it with some of the music teachers and people really like it. It, it, it actually does work that way. I'm not making this up. We actually have a video where I can show you, it's only about two minutes long, I can show you, I actually use this and you can actually hear the sound as well. So I'm going to play that for you now. The app I'm going to show you today is called Impactor. It is a drum app. It actually turns your table into a drum. I know it sounds crazy, but it actually does work. It's a fun app, but it creates engagement fairly quickly. It's simple to use and it's a lot of fun. And it's definitely a way to engage someone with a musical activity. So I'm going to click on Impactor. And this is what it looks like. I have the volume turned down because it's very sensitive. So you can see uh, the different types of drums on the bottom. This is that's on currently a metal drum. They have different knobs and stuff on it that you can adjust. So the sound is down. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the sound back up again. All right, I had to turn the volume all the way down because otherwise it, it, it really impacts what we're doing. All right, so I, ha I have it off. So you get the idea. It's a fairly simple app, but it can quickly engage someone into an activity. And even if you weren't te teaching music, this is a great way to break people out of their shell to have some fun in the classroom. It's one of my favorite apps because it's so cool. It's something that, that, I, that I do use where I work and, and I enjoy very much. This is John O'Sullivan, and I'm talking about Impactor. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a paid app for for the iPad, and it's one of my favorite. And I use it in the library um, often as I can because what happens is students a lot of times if they're having a bad day or you know it can be stressed from midterms, you use that and people people are happy and it, it changes um, people's body language pretty quickly when using that, and they can't believe it actually works. Which the technology for it isn't actually that complicated, but it, it's such a cool concept. To think that you could you could turn your table into an instrument, and you can actually record it, and it can actually be useful, which is really amazing. So that's one I really like. I have in my makerspace, and it's something that when I have classes, I like to show them because it's guaranteed to get them engaged. And if it does anything, it will at least change their mood pretty quickly. 
um, and it's definitely very good for stress. But obviously, you could teach musical concepts with that as well, and you could actually make music with it and record it and use it in the song somewhere if you if that was your goal. So, but you know, you don't have to have a full drum stick set or drumsticks. You can just have your iPad and, and an app, which is really wonderful. So um, we're going to move on and some other ones now. These are, are synthesizers. Synthesizers make music. Like in other words, basically you can make the sound of different instruments and mix them together. And synthesizers can be different. Some they vary. Some of them have you make the the individual songs and they, each individual sound. Other ones give you the sounds and mix them together. And there's a ton of them out there that are very good. The number of for some reason it seems like the people who like computers and like music because you use music you have to be very creative but then you have to be very kind of exact so there are a lot of people who are musicians who also like computers so the amount of apps out there or synthesizers there's a lot of them there's, a, there's definitely an audience for it so these are ones for for Android devices so in, in case uh, you don't have iPads and and or you don't want to spend as much money maybe you want an Android tablet uh, these are these are some options to use okay these are for Chrome which this surprised me there it's, it's crossing over to Chrome and these get very good ratings so you can actually make music if you um, are a Google school and you're using Chromebooks or if you have a PC you could use it as well because these extensions should install on your Chrome browser on a PC so this should open up a lot of options for people if you wanted to to use music with students, either to relieve stress or to teach, uh, to teach music or to include them or whatever your goal is, here's a great option. And this is something that most people should be able to use. Obviously, if you have either Chromebooks or a PC, it's th these are three good options. Okay, so this is the list of apps for 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 iPads. There's a ton of. There's so many out there that if you're looking for something specific, they probably have something about it. And they they. There's a, the list is so long. I, I could have included another page in this. I just didn't bother. But there's so many that have like four and a half or five stars that are just unbelievably good apps. So the, the options if you have iPads are definitely there as well. So question. Uh, this is a question. This is for this is really for me. And this is a question that I ask. I, I think about all the time. Um, but do you currently use technology with the goal of creating engagement? For me, that's something that's a big thing of what I like to do. I think that's very important. And I know early on in my career when I was a young special ed teacher and they were talking about motivating students and I would say, well, how do you motivate students? I mean, it's really hard to convince somebody to do something that either they don't want to do or they're in a bad mood and they don't feel like working. And I think 20 years ago, my answer was I didn't know how to motivate students. Now, today with the technologies out there, motivating students I think is something that is more possible than ever before. It is really, really something that there's technology out there that gauge students, just like we showed with the art apps and the music apps and the, the music website. There's so many ways to engage students and to, to get them to be an active part of the learning process. And even if, even, if, even if you don't have an academic goal, there are things obviously out there you can have them do to change their frame of mind, to change their mood, because Anxiety is an issue that is much more prevalent, I think, today than it was 20 years ago. And I'm not 100% sure. Maybe we know more about it today and we recognize it more today. That's part of it. I think some of the anxiety is higher because maybe some there are changes in our society, either with the family or with, with high-stakes testing. But I, I believe that engaging people and looking for technology to engage people is an, is an absolute goal that I have. And I hope that's a goal that if, if you don't have right now, that I hope that that's something you think about, especially from, from listening to this webinar, that maybe you'll pick up one or two things that you can really bring back to engage your students. So this is a big one for me. Uh, one of the things we do in the Learning Commons is we, we make green screen videos. And it, this used to be like, video editing used to be something for the high-end computer user like me, and it's not anymore. Now it's something that everybody can really do. It's gotten so much simpler with a lot of these apps that are out there. It's gotten where the average person can do this. And green screens, where you, you call it a chroma key, green screens is something that was really a high level video editing activity. It wasn't something for the average person. And now it's so simple that literally in like two minutes, I can show people how to do this. It's so simple. Less. Two minutes is long. I could say in under a minute, I could teach high school students. I mean, with elementary school students, 
I could probably might take me two or three minutes. But it's it's something that you with a large population, this is something that is completely in reach. And this is an app called Green Screen. It's by Doing. And this is the app that people predominantly use to make green screen videos. And when you put a different background behind people, they love it. If this works with adults really well. It works with high school students. I guarantee you work with younger children. It will definitely once you put a picture behind people and have them act out a scene, people just do it. It works. I'm not always sure why it works, but I've never had anybody who didn't like it or didn't want to didn't want to play along with it. Uh, the, we we put lots of pictures behind people and we have them either talk about something or sometimes act things out. Um, or for the foreign language class, a lot of times they they talk in that foreign language, whether it's Spanish or French. Now green screens. The other thing is people talk about how to make a green screen. This is a projector that I have where I work, and I turned it into a green screen. All I simply did was I went to uh, YouTube and I looked, typed in the word green screen, and it, and it just puts that color in the background, and you expand the YouTube video like you would to watch a YouTube video, and it plays a blank screen in front of you. So you can you can make a green screen. You, a lot of people can do make one simply with like a green sheet, or you can buy them. They're not too expensive if you buy them, but if it was a one-day lesson, you could turn your projector into a green screen. I uh, simply go to YouTube and you type in green screen video. Um, it is something that is really awesome and exciting to do if you can you can bring this into your classroom. Okay, this is a video of me using Do Inc. I turned my TV in my home into a green screen, and I'm going to show you how. And you can see step by step of how to do this. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna play this video in just a minute. And you're going to get to see exactly how to turn either your TV or your projector into a green screen in, in, in exactly two minutes. The app we're going to use now is called Green Screen by Do Inc. It is a green screen app. It's also a video app. It helps you make very simple videos. It is this strange octopus looking creature over here. I'm going to click on it. Then I'm going to hit the, the plus symbol, which is right up here, to create a, a new project. Then I'm going to hit the little plus symbol on the bottom, and I'm going to add in a picture. I'm going to click on image. And then I'm going to set my background where it looks like the background of an iPad. I'm going to click on that. And I'm going to click on use. And then I click on the little plus down here. And I'm going to click on camera. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my TV into a green screen. You can do the same thing with your projector. It's really easy to do. You just have to search blank green screen on YouTube and then play that video. It's as simple as that. Um, it works very effective in a classroom and also in your home if you like to play around with green screens. To turn your TV or in your classroom your projector into a green screen, all you do is go to YouTube and type in the words blank green screen video and a number of videos will come up that are blank green screens. The first one that comes up is fine. It's a blank green screen that lasts 10 hours. That should be good. So every classroom with a projector, you can turn the background to a green screen, no problem. If you have a TV at home, you can do that as well. It's very simple. So my TV's behind me. It doesn't look like it looks like I'm trapped in an iPad. Um, but all I did was I turned the TV into the green screen. Now if I move back a little bit, you'll see the TV appear behind me. But if I move forward, you can see it looks like you can see the iPad uh, as my background. And you could do this in a classroom with a projector as well. It's a little bit easier because you probably don't have to sit on the floor to do it. This is John O'Sullivan. So if you ever want to flip your classroom, like people talk about it, flipping your classroom and you make a video and you have them watch at home, well, you know, a lot of people, you don't realize that you have the ability to play YouTube on your TV. A lot of times the cable services give that to you and you can search into it, but if they don't, on the back of your TV, the, usually there's type of connections. It's uh, the similar connections that you'd see in your computer. Uh, one's called VGA and the other's called HDMI. The same connections on your computer on your TV, and you can actually hook your computer up to your TV. If you don't know how to do it, obviously that takes a little time. We go, I, I, I don't have time to go into the details, but you can do it, and if even if you don't know how to do that, like I said, a lot of the cable services, uh, I know, I know, through RCN I've done it, I've done it with Comcast in the past. A lot of times you can search YouTube on it and you can you can make that video at home if you want to flip your classroom or you can go into your classroom and you can put it on your projector and you can put a, a picture of whatever the topic of the day is and have your students act it out and 
it will be a lot of fun, a lot of fun. You really, really change the atmosphere of your classroom. Like if you have people that come in and they're having a bad day and they're stressed out and something, something wrong is happening, you can put that green screen on your projector. You can put a really cool picture behind it and you can do just about anything. And immediately you're going to have students who are engaged, who are having fun and it's exciting. And th this is an app. It's only for the iPad, unfortunately. Um, the ones for Android that I find that do green screen take pictures. This is the one that does video. And the fact that it's so simple is why this app is the best app out, out there. Because literally, I can show someone how to how to make a green screen video in in two minutes or less. Um, it's it's that wonderful. So if you do have an iPad, I'd recommend getting this app and turning your projector into a green screen and, and you'll have a lot of fun with this. Okay, so if you don't have an iPad, like because I got I gotta I, I don't want to be iPad centric here. Uh, Screencastify, you can't make a green screen with it, but you can put a webcam video over your presentations. Like uh, that's a, a picture of me uh, over a past presentation that I did and I talk over it. So in other words, you can take a PowerPoint and you can put a video over it and then you could talk over the video and it immediately makes it a dy dynamic presentation. And it's simple. That is the most important thing when you're using a new technology. I know everybody wants to use something where within a few minutes you can get your class going on it. So if, you're, if you don't have iPads and you're a Chrome a school or sorry, a Google school and you have Chromebooks, th this is one that you, you might want to consider using because you find today that the, uh, the Chromebooks and the PCs have webcams already in them. You can simply ha g give a presentation or have your students give a presentation and they can talk over it and they can practice a number of skills and do so in a very dynamic way without spending a lot of time figuring out the technical aspects of it. And um, so let me go on to the next one. If you, if you download the PowerPoint, a lot of these you can see I have videos connected to them that you can watch how to do these. This is uh, called Adobe Spark. This one is online. This is kind of a, a tweener program. It's really a presentation that turns into a video. They call it a video. It's kind of like if you took slides, Google Slides or PowerPoint, and then turned into a video where you see some very simple movement. This is a great program, and they are now doing something different. There's a link to it. Adobe Spark in September, they're going to start working with schools where they can use a school login and they're giving um, the more advanced features of the product to schools for free. The link on there explains about it. So if you're looking for something to do that's a little bit more dynamic with students, this is, like I said, it's a presentation, but it's a presentation that turns into a video. This is something that you might want to consider using. Okay, so obviously to create engagement and to to really get your students to do something games are a big thing and I know people talk about gamification well we can't turn everything into you know a video game I, I don't think we're at that point but there's a lot of positive aspect from games that we can we can use with our lessons and I say as long as we can link it to the curriculum and the primary goal is to teach the curriculum and the game part isn't a distraction taking away from I, I'm all for it so there's a lot of very simple games that we're used to playing and we've played before and we can actually integrate this into our curriculum, which is kind of awesome. That's definitely a great way to engage people. So one of the examples I use is Jeopardy. These are two different sites. Uh, Jeopardy Labs has a free version and a paid version. Jeopardy Rock, Rocks is, is free and you can make a Jeopardy game. Jeopardy works for all different ages. The younger ages will use it. The older ages will use it. It's a great way to do review. If, if you have a group that wants to review for a test, it's a good way to, to get, give the students feedback on how much information that they know on a particular subject area. But it's also one of those activities when you, you have to get work done, you're teaching towards standards, and you really need to engage students because you know it's, it's a Friday and it's hot out, or this is a distraction because you know we're out for a snow day. This is a great way to refocus people where you can turn it into, into a game where you can make learning a little more engaging, a little more fun. And the brilliant part about it, it's simple to use. So that you don't have to be techy or geeky to do that. It's a little like filling out a template and you fill in the questions and you know you'll find within a half hour you could you could fill out one of these and use it with one of your classes. And I did make a video on it. We're not showing it, but if you go to the PowerPoint you can click on that link if you want to learn how to use one of those these programs. Um, so 
that that's something you might want to consider uh, doing if you download the PowerPoint. Mad Libs. Okay, this is an iPad app I have for, for Mad Libs. Now, I will warn you about Mad Libs. If you're a middle school teacher, you might be nervous about using Mad Libs. I, I work in a high school. I know the high school teachers I work with would tell you don't use Mad Libs with them, but I've seen this used with elementary school students. And this is a great way to teach people the parts of speech, the, the different, the, what verbs are, what nouns are, what adjectives are, what adverbs are. You can teach them all that, and then they can have fun doing it. I, I mean, I've, I've seen teachers use this, either the paper form or, in this case, the app form. And you can teach these things, and I see where I've seen a whole class where people are laughing, but people are learning those different parts of grammar. And, you know, teaching grammar, because I've taught grammar before, it's not it's something that sometimes can seem not always the most exciting thing to do when you have to kind of drill and practice and do it. So if you can make this a fun activity where people are engaged and laughing and enjoying it and thinking of things that We'll make it. We'll make it the story interesting when you read it, but won't get you in trouble, or won't get them in trouble is maybe a better way to say it. Um, this is a great activity, Mad Libs, and this is a great app. This one is for, for the iPad, and I have a link to it. They also, I believe, there's also an Android. Is there an Android? I believe there's an Android version for this one as well. It's on two plans. Yeah, it says Android. So if you if you if you if you don't have an iPad, you could use this on the, on an Android, uh, either phone or tablet. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next one. This is Algebra Touch. This is one of my personal favorite apps of all time. It's a math app, and it's so hard to get something to teach math that is really engaging and that can make that difficult, stressful math problem something that is, 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 can be actually even kind of fun because it shows you all of the steps, and it makes it seem easy because if you don't know how to use, do the problem, you can actually click on it and try moving things, and you'll find out you'll actually be solving the problem even if you didn't know anything to begin with. It literally shows you step-by-step step how to do math problems. And the brilliance of this, it will show you simple math like adding or subtracting. It will show you more complicated math like algebra. And you can even put in your own problems. But the way it shows you step-by-steps, it doesn't give you the answer. It forces you to learn it. But it, it, it makes you feel more comfortable because if you didn't know what to do, you could literally start touching the screen of the iPad, and you would see progress. Uh, this is an iPad app, so I'm going to click on the next one. We have a video for this one, and when you see this video, you'll see how quick and fast this goes, uh, how user-friendly it is. Uh, it's one of my favorite apps of all time. We're going to play it for you right now. This is Algebra Touch. This is one of my all-time favorite apps because it teaches math, and it teaches math by showing you every step, and it does it on different levels, like it's, it's called Algebra Touch, but it will work with simple adding. So if I just simply, if I touch the plus symbols, it, it adds them. So very simple. And you can type in your own problems with this as well. So let's get a little bit more complicated, uh, combining like terms. So you can hit the plus symbol, or I, I, say I can drag 17 over to 2C, right, 17C to 2C, and I get the plus symbol. And it gives me the answer. So, and it, and it gets more complicated from there. There's multiplication. There's factors. Let's try distribution. That's a little more complicated. Okay. So, I can drag the 18 over. I can drag the 8 over. See, you keep hitting different things until something happens. But it shows you what it's doing. See, it shows you how it's actually distributing it. It just doesn't do it on its own. And that's what's really awesome about this program is it shows you each individual step. So the, the really great part is you can create your own problems, and that's what makes this so amazing. So this is a quick problem. And so if I want to type in 2 plus 34 minus 5, well, <laughs> I guess I hit one too many numbers there, but you get the idea. And then I can simply start clicking on the symbols, and it combines like terms. And we'll give you the answer. But it shows you each individual step. So it's not about giving the answer. It's about showing process. And that can take a lot of the fear out of math. That's why I really love uh, this app and I highly recommend it. It's called Algebra Touch, but it does things way beyond algebra. It does things like the distributed property or, or basic adding and subtracting or, or, or multiplication. 
Um, so it's a really great app. This is uh, John O'Sullivan. Yeah, that that is a great app if you're using it with a student, especially if you have them like like a learning center, research room type type classroom where they can sit and do math and practice doing it. And then you, the thing about it is everybody struggles with math. Even adults struggle with math. I mean, I, I'm, I'm someone who's always good at math, and sometimes I look at the stuff the high school students have to do, and I'm like, wow, I've never seen that before. So well, the brilliant thing about this is you don't feel like that when you're using it because even if you had no idea what to do, you could literally start touching it, and it would eventually do the problem for you pretty quickly at, at that. Uh, and something about touching it and showing you each step, it makes you stop and think about what's actually happening in the problem, which I would tell you from math teacher's point of view, that, that is certainly a, a, a big deal um, to, to stop and see how the problems are, not just having to give you the answer. Um, that is always huge that it, it, uh, you, can see, you can see how to do the, uh, the, the problem. So, um, so that is Algebra Touch. Um, so I would tell people if you um, if you join us late, I would tell you if you have a chance to download the PowerPoint that has all the different links to different things that we're doing. I would tell you to download the um, the uh, PowerPoint because it, we have uh, bonus videos, and um, we we also have lots of other information here that you can use as well. Because I try to find things that are on different platforms. Uh, so that I'm not just being accused of being iPad centric, and we'll move right along. Okay, this is another one here, which is which is really kind of cool. What I'm finding is that I can find stuff to get find books on tape to get stuff read to me. There's a lot out there that I, I'm finding now that will will read stuff on your screen. There's a lot of extensions for Chrome that will do that. But I, the next wave that I really see is that you can actually turn text into an mp3 it's the coolest thing this used to be something you had to pay a lot of money for like in other words you used to have to buy a high level program you had to buy Kurzweil or something like that or or some other high level program and as part of that it would turn text into an mp3 now you can go online literally cut and paste some text hit a button and it'll turn into an mp3 for you so we've gone beyond having text to speech so, because there's a lot of that out there, because we're finding that on the operating systems, there are there are extensions for the Chrome browser that will read stuff to you that's on the screen. But most people haven't thought of turning into an MP3. Now, something like if you, for instance, had notes or something that people had to study, you could simply cut and paste it and then download it as an MP3. This particular website works very well. There's a bunch of them out there, and I find some of them work, some of them don't. This one works very well, but there are others out there that you could find. If you simply to Google text to MP3, there's a number of websites that come up. It's free, and if you have something important that, that you're working on and you want a student to learn it in a multi-sensory way, you could have them cut and paste it, or you could do it yourself too, cut and paste it, download it as an MP3, and then they could obviously listen to it over and over again. But students these days are coming into school with um, with those smartphones. They could, you could, they could put it on their smartphone, and they could listen to those notes over and over and over again when they're studying for a test. And if you have worksheets or something in the classroom that you need read to students, simply take that Microsoft Work document, copy and paste it into the website and download it, and all of a sudden you have the document where it can be read to somebody, which is which is really, really great. And I think this is uh, something that people haven't thought of to use yet, but is, a, is an amazing tool that I certainly would recommend people trying if they haven't already. So this is another one. and. I always look for stuff for executive function, and when it comes to executive function, um, I always I always feel like you know, in other words, use the stuff that helps, like you know, putting things into a calendar or making a to-do list, or in this case, setting reminders. I, it's almost like you really have you, you in order to help someone with an executive function, they have to do all these a number of tasks, and something like reminders is so important that we all need it. I mean, I have a schedule on my cell phone. My cell phone reminds me to do things. But when you're in a classroom with, with a number of students and you're very busy, it's hard for us to keep track of time. So this is something you could do is you could set reminders for students, especially if you have students who are on the autism spectrum who need anticipation before they do something, who need to be told at a certain time that, that something the schedule is changing. 
you can set reminders. And a lot of times as teachers, we get stuck setting these reminders. Obviously, we can have the student do it. You know, sometimes people who don't have a good executive function need someone around them who has a better one, like like adults in their lives. So it, it, a lot of times we get stuck setting these, but it is so important because I know, I know even when I'm teaching adults, I'll say we have five minutes left, we have 10 minutes left, and I, I come constantly find myself pacing. But it's so important to have those breaks and those reminders in there, especially for people who have difficulty in the area of executive function. And this is a simple way. This is an app that gets a lot of reminders that you can use that will, will, will remind you of different things. And obviously, someone has to go and set the reminders, either you or the student. But this app gets a lot of ratings. A lot of people don't think of using something like this. But again, when you're, when you're teaching a group of students and you're in constant motion, you're constantly busy, it's going to be hard to remember in a half hour what you have to say or an hour from now you have to say, or you have to remind people five minutes ahead of time to do something. And pacing of our classes is a big thing that we do. And we don't always get the break. So I always recommend this is a good way of doing it, setting alarm reminders. This is one for the iPad that I really like. OK, this is, another, this is another one for me. This is a joystick and a mouse. This might be a, maybe a pet peeve of mine. But prices for stuff for people with physical disabilities have gone way down for a lot of the items out there. Not everything, but a lot of it. This is a, a joystick. You can get a joystick either for a mouse or an iPad. You can get them for like $300, $400 tops. Usually it's closer to $300 to buy one of these. And if you have someone you work with, a student that has a, that has a physical disability, I, I recommend going on buying a lot of this stuff because it, it's not not that the money should be the determining factor, but you, you can get stuff for a couple hundred dollars. And like I said, if it doesn't work out, pretty much all these places have standard return policies of 30 days because I've called them up before because I get... I get teachers who are nervous, well, what if it doesn't work? I said, it's okay. We can return it. There's a store. They will take it back. It won't be the first time something's being returned. But it's, it seems a lot less threatening when we have to go into meetings instead of saying we have to spend thousands of dollars to spend a couple hundred. But I, it, we're, not, we're not enabling the students if we're not going out and spending the money to include people by using these devices. So I always point out that the technology, the price have come way down. And a joystick or some form of adaptive mouse, you can get them. You can get them for the iPad. You can get them for PCs. So you can get them for regular mainframe computers, your laptop, or or a tablet. They're out there, and they don't cost nearly as much as you think. And if you use it and it's a disaster, you can always return it. So I try to. Re this is something I try to constantly remind people of it because I I I I, I hear sometimes so and so is having a problem with this, and I find out it's been going on for a long time. I'm like, you know. This stuff is available, and it's certainly within reach of all of us. I, just, I want people to know that. Okay, this is a really cool one. We talk about global education. We're, you know, we have the global classroom. And a global classroom, a lot of times what that means is we're video conferencing with people in other parts of the world, or even, other, even our hometown, or, or, or just the town that we're working in, that we're, we're using video conference. Now this is a microphone inside of a ball. So the idea is it's a wireless microphone inside of a ball and you could pass to students and you could have a speaker anywhere in the world come into your classroom via video conferencing. And you can say, I have a global classroom. And obviously with certain students you wanna be careful about letting them throw the ball. The ball is soft so you, you, if, if it's, as long as they're not doing anything too outrageous, you shouldn't hurt anybody. It's, it's like a regular ball, but has a microphone in it. And they can simply pass the microphone around the class, the wireless microphone. It works really well. And then you can say you have a global classroom, and then you can try to find people from either other parts of the country. Or even in the town that you work in, you could talk to important people, and you can have people visit the class. And it opens avenues like never before to help people with social skills, to help connect people with the community to talk about a subject and bring in an expert into your classroom. And they don't have to drive to the school. Even if they live they live a few miles away, they don't have to drive there. And it's quick and it's easy. Um, it opens up avenues we haven't thought before. And this is a company I've actually followed when they were, for, before they even were in development, where they were like, uh, they were just basically an upstart. So this is called Q-Ball. Uh, this is one certainly that I recommend. Magnification apps. One of the things that we used to do is we used to go out and spend large sums of money on magnifiers for people who are visually impaired. And now today with an iPad, they have like an, they, it comes free on an iPad where it magnifies it. These are two apps I like, and the reason I like them, they're free apps, and I like them because they freeze the screen. So 
In other words, if you're reading something, you hit a button and it locks it. And then if you move the tablet or or the phone, it doesn't shake. It 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 keeps it keeps the picture solid and it doesn't move it. And they're free. So you can use the ones that come free in operating systems. You can use the one that that come on tend to come on uh, your iPad or your iPhone or on to Android devices if you're using that. But th this is ones for the iPad that I like because it locks. And I always tell people if you're using a magnifier, using a tablet as a magnifier that you want to use one that locks and these are, are two of my personal favorites. Okay, and we have another last thing I want to talk about. We talked about personalized learning is a big thing in the field and by using technology, personalized learning means it gives that individual feedback on how they're doing. It personalizes it, but there's also depersonalized learning and I'll tell you from experience, people get less stressed out when, when your phone tells you you're doing something wrong or when, when Microsoft Word has a little squiggly red underline and you misspelled the word because people feel as though when they're getting negative feedback on a computer, it's private and the whole world isn't seeing it. So you have personalized learning in the sense that they're getting individual feedback and you have depersonalized learning. It is not as much stress when you're getting feedback from a computer. One, because it gives you the feedback immediately so it wasn't sitting there very long where you thought it was right. So you correct the problem right away. But it's also like if you ever had someone who you really thought very highly of correct you, you know, your parents or a teacher, for some reason when those authority figures correct us, it's more painful. But when we get that feedback and it's private, it's less painful. So I, I, I try to point this out when people are using computers, you get personalized feedback, but you also get depersonalized feedback because it's less stressful. And that's a big deal to a lot of students because there's a lot of stresses on students today. So we're up to the last part. I, I somehow fit all that in to exactly an hour. I don't know how I did that. Um, we went over a lot. I, I hope I found some really cool things for everybody to look at. And I would imagine if, if, you, if, you, uh, if you've been listening for a while that you have found a, a, at least two or three really cool things that you could probably start in your classrooms now and to make it more engaging or to, to help students who have disabilities. If anybody has any questions, now would be a good time. I would... I'll try to answer them best as I can. And the PowerPoint has a lot of information. I have six more videos on how to do things. And there's a ton of links and information so that if I didn't cover it, you, there's a, a slew of information that you could use in that subject to find the answer for yourself. But if you have a question, I'd be happy to answer them right now if anybody has any questions. Okay, let's see, yeah. Okay, uh, someone's saying, okay, it was, uh, it was text MP3, not speak to MP3, okay. Uh, okay, people are liking the ideas, that's good. Um, this is great, thank you. I'll take thank yous. Thank yous are always good. I like, like hearing that. Thank you very much. I'm glad people enjoyed it. Um, I put a lot of time into this, so if I can... Um, if I can help somebody out with technology, I'm, I'm, always, I'm always happy to do that. Can't wait to go over the PowerPoint. Yeah, the PowerPoint, there's a ton of information in the PowerPoint. We showed six videos, but there's six more videos in the PowerPoint. And as you've seen from my videos, they're very straight to the point of this is what you need to do it. And you can tell I've been a special ed teacher for a long time. I'm very good at giving directions and cutting out distractions. Um, so if you liked any of these videos, definitely download the PowerPoint and then look at the information that's relevant to you because a lot of it's crossing over to platforms. When I wrote my first book, it was all about iPad apps. And since then, I now write about uh, stuff that's on other platforms like you know, Chrome, which you'll find a Chromebook or a PC or on a Macintosh computer. Someone asked if Algebra Talk worked with VoiceOver. Okay. Uh, VoiceOver. I've never tried it with VoiceOver. Um, VoiceOver works with most apps. I guess you could try it. Um, I, I haven't tried it to be certain. I would expect that it probably does because most of them do. Do you have any other questions? Okay. Um, well, I want to say thank you. It's been wonderful. I absolutely love doing this and I'm, I'm thrilled that I've had the opportunity to do this a second time. 
Um, and certainly I'd love to come back again. I hope you have a slew of information to go over and that you're able to use all this information to engage your students and to include your students whenever possible in things like art and music. It's been a pleasure. I would like to thank you very much on behalf of the, the Center for Technology and Disability. Thank you very much for attending. Thanks, John. That was great. Great to be here. I enjoyed every minute of it.